everyone. I'm Becky, the executive director at HIF. Aloha. Thank you so much for joining us um, for this HIF Talk story uh, with director Roseanne Liang. This is part of our New American Perspectives program, which is presented by the Vilcek Foundation. Everyone at HIF just absolutely adores this program. Um, as well as um, Roseanne and her film Shadow in the Cloud. So we really, really recommend you check out all the, all the films in the New American Perspectives program. We're so blessed to have the Vilcek Foundation as an incredible partner on this program for years. The purpose of the New American Perspectives program is to really shine a spotlight on the contributions of foreign-born filmmakers and immigrant filmmakers to contemporary cinema all across the United States. So. We're so pleased that you're joining us tonight. Thank you so much. Um, and without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce the incredible Elizabeth Boylan from the Vilcek Foundation, who is their communications manager. Hi, Becky. Thank you so much. Um, we are thrilled to be working with HIF again this year and presenting the New American Perspectives program. Um, as Becky mentioned, I'm Liz Boylan, and I work with the Vilcek Foundation. Uh, we were established in 2000 by Jan and Maritza Vilcek with the mission of celebrating the contributions of foreign-born artists and innovators in arts, culture, and society in the United States and around the world. Uh, one of the ways we accomplish our mission is through partners in the arts, especially folks like HIF. And since 2007, we've worked with HIF to present a program that, as Becky mentioned, highlights and shares the work of foreign-born filmmakers, artists, and creators with all of the festival's audiences. Um, you know, the partnership came out of the shared values between HIF and the Vilcek Foundation. And so it's really a pleasure each year to sort of build on that relationship and move forward with it. Uh, we were thrilled this year when Anderson reached out to us and um, he and the team at HIF invited us to work with Roseanne Liang and share her film, Shadow in the Cloud at this year's festival. Uh, we loved the film and were just blown away by Liang's direction and her storytelling. Um, I think especially with all the challenges that 2020 has presented us, um, you know, arts and artists and innovators have really persevered and film especially has remained a form of art that's been really accessible to people and how we are communicating with one another right now. Um, so it's really special to be able to connect over the festival, uh, though we're all in different places right now. Um, so again, we're thrilled to be working with HIF and we're delighted to support bringing uh, this talk between Anderson and Roseanne to you this evening. Um, I'll turn it back to you, Anderson, to give a more formal introduction to Roseanne, but uh, thank you to you and Becky and the entire HIF team. Thank you, Liz. Uh, thank you for the intro. Um, it's my great pleasure to um, uh, host this conversation with uh, filmmaker Roseanne Liang. Uh, who hails from New Zealand. Um, and before we start, I just want to give a quick bio on Roseanne um, as I bring it up really quick. So we, let's learn about Roseanne Liang. Roseanne enjoys the cut and thrust of genre, social re resonance, and culture. Her feature film, My Wedding and Other Secrets, is the most successful New Zealand Asian feature film to date, based on her festival hit documentary, Banana in a Nutshell. Roseanne has also made award-winning work across TV comedy and short film, including Berlin-winning Take Three, cult favorite web series Flat Three, uh, Friday Night Bites, and Sundance South by Southwest breakout action short Do No Harm. Roseanne's latest U uh, U.S. action thriller feature film Shadow in the Cloud stars Chloe, Chloe Grace Moretz, Nick Robinson, and Hawaii Five O's Mula Kuale. It premiered last month uh, at the Toronto International Film Festival, where it won the People's Choice Midnight Madness Award. So uh, without further ado, let's uh, give a warm aloha to Roseanne, or, or should I say Kia ora. Kia ora, Kia ora. aloha. Yeah, we're all, we're all sisters and brothers here. In yes, the exactly. Exactly. Yeah. How are you? And you're, you're, I believe you're zooming in from Auckland, right? That's right. I'm in Auckland, New Zealand. We're one hour behind tomorrow. That's so right. it's Saturn. <laughs> anyway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you don't need to know about that. <laughs> yeah. know. I'm in the future. <laughs> yeah, you're in the future. Yes, you're, it's, it's daytime. It's morning or whatever. It's morning, yeah. 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 So, <laughs> Roseanne, thank you for joining us and for participating in the NAP program. Uh, um, you know, we, we, I mean, I personally have tracked your, your, your work for many years. Um, I first learned about you uh, from your, your film, uh, uh, Wedding and Other Secrets, um, 
uh, which uh, was uh, shown at HIF many years ago. Uh, That's right. And uh, you know, so so let's before. So this is going to be kind of like a this is your life, Roseanne. We're going to walk <laughs> through your walk through your life uh, uh, as a as an artist, and also um, what's really interesting is you um, being of uh, uh, you know. Uh, Asian descent uh, from New Zealand uh, as a Kiwi, um, you know, just see some, a lot of your earlier work has a lot of like, I would say, uh, similarities to, you know, a lot of Asian American filmmakers uh, when they're exploring the different types of, um, you know, I mean, anywhere from identity politics to, you know, uh, uh, it's, you know, basically uh, the, uh, you know, the, the, the very little um, opportunities when it comes to, um, uh, you know the film industry, so to speak. You know, with Take Three is a perfect example. But um, so, but let's start about let's talk about kind of your family life first. Uh, you know, so what? How? Um, you know, um, uh, your family. I mean, I believe your family immigrated to New Zealand, right? From from China. Can you just start from there? Uh, from from Hong Kong. Yeah, my oh, parents came. Okay. Yeah, my parents are Hong Kong stock, and I yeah. I would travel back to Hong Kong in childhood, maybe once every two years um, to visit my extended family who still live there. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, we, we had a, a typical immigrant upbringing <laughs> in that um, we were encouraged to, we were hot housed. My mother was, you know, you could call her a tiger mom. Um, she insisted that I always achieve to the best of my abilities um, and uh, you know, achieve really good grades at school while also doing extracurricular activities, piano, ballet, speech and drama, um, uh, the works. Uh, mm -hmm. So that, that, was, that was my upbringing. I'm the youngest of three daughters. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, my dad was a doctor, is a doctor, um, a pediatrician, a specialist. And um, my two sisters became doctors as well. And I, I guess I, I took a different path. Um, even yeah. though my sisters are very creative in different ways. Mm -hmm. And so, were you when you go, were you when you were going to university? I believe you uh, were you also on that kind of like medical school path, or at least some yes. kind of like okay, got it. Uh, so um, I mean, yeah. Go ahead. Um, yeah. So I mean, so I was um, I. <laughs> we we went to school, and and both my sisters were valedictorian of their school, and and I worked my ass off because I didn't want to be the stupid sister and that <laughs> this was the kind of family, this overachievement thing that was going sure. on in our family. And and I finally achieved and I got really good grades and and um and I was valedictorian eventually. And normally what you do in that situation is either go to law school or go to medical school or, mm -hmm. you know, do something with your good grades. Um, and when I said I was, uh, I, I got into medical school and my sister said, why are you going to med medical school? And I said, I don't know, because you guys are. And, my, you know, I'd like to be able to join the conversation around the table when, you know, you talk about medical stuff. Mm -hmm. And my sister said, that's not a good reason to become a doctor. That, you know, just doing it because we're doing it is not a good enough reason. We yeah. recommend that um, it's seven years, it's a seven year commitment at medical school in New Zealand um, initially. And then you go into, if you want to specialize, it's another you know years and years of specialization after that mm -hmm. and they said we you can defer a year you can stay you can still keep your place in medical school but defer a year and we encourage you to do something that is for you to discover yourself essentially mm -hmm. so um i um i by then but at that time i was obsessed with computer animation i was obsessed with what pixar was doing mm -hmm. and i did a conjoint degree uh, conjoint papers in arts and science um mm -hmm. focusing on computer science Oh, interesting. Um, and so that's like, uh, a, like a double major. When, didn't you double, a double major? major. Uh, it's a, it was a double degree. Like it double was a, BS, okay. a bachelor of arts and bachelor of science um, at the okay. same time. Got it. And uh, it takes a little bit longer to do, but you know, you, you get a double degree at the end of it. Um, mm -hmm. And so I did, I did that. I did computer science. I, I really love maths and, um, and, the pure maths mm -hmm. and then I also loved I took some philosophy papers I took some logic papers yeah. I did some women's studies papers and then I also did some film studies papers mm -hmm. and that was where the dark arts got a, ho yeah. a hold of me <laughs> yeah. 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 and I realized I realized I'd always been a lover of movies and I and peeking behind the curtain and seeing a little bit of the mm -hmm. language of cinema yeah. Um, really took a hold of me. And the tutors there said, um, the lecturers there said, 
we we think you could keep going you know we think you could actually be a filmmaker mm. um you know think about it and then by the end of the year i was like okay this is what i'm gonna do yeah so was that that was your turning point uh taking that class or uh, did you have any uh interest i mean you, you earlier talked about you know, um participating in you know, aside from being, you know, like a, you know, like a, you know, eventual valedictorian and lots of lecture curriculars, uh, did you, did you do like maybe uh, in, in high school and previous uh, university, were you practicing in, were you in the media class? So were you uh, shooting, uh, you know, in videos uh, with your friends or were you in the theater scene at all or? Um, I mean, I, I was doing speech and drama, so I enjoyed performance. And um, I, uh, my dad was always archiving things. He always had a video camera or, a, you know, back in the day when I was a kid, he had a Super 8 camera. So he was, he was always an archivist. So I always had access to this technology. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I was making graduation films for my friends at, in, in our final year of school. Um, but, but the other thing that I realized was that I, I really loved movies on a, on a, on a deeper level. Like I realized looking back that the seminal moments um, were like um, I was in 1994 when Pulp Fiction came out, it was an R18 movie in New Zealand mm -hmm. and I was underage at that time and I I'd heard that it won the Cannes Film Festival that year mm -hmm. and I took it upon myself to get and get to a screening of of Pulp Fiction at the cinema so I literally pretended I went on a busy Friday night I pretended not to speak English I just <laughs> went I pretended not to speak English when the ticket guy asked me for my ID you like uh-huh Oh, uh -huh. And he was, he got so frustrated with me, like in my, in my shitty, my, my really bad Asian accent, pretending that I didn't know how to speak English, that he literally threw the tickets at me and was like, ah, you know, this person doesn't understand when I'm asking for her ID, I'm just going to give it the tickets. Right. And, um, and I, and I watched that movie in a state of awe at what was going on on the screen. Like I'd never seen a movie told in this way before. Yeah. So much style in the, you know, in that time, you know, the, the switching of time and right. simultaneously terrified that there was someone who had somehow seen <laughs> my exchange at the box office and was going to call me out and be like, you know how to speak English. You, you comprehend, get out, you know, right, you're right, over right. age, get out. Yeah. Like you're so, like, you scared to get in trouble, right? You're going to get caught or something. Yeah. Right? I, I wasn't, I was, I was the good girl. I was the, girl. the scholar and the good girl, but I, I would break the rules for film and right. I never regretted it. I, I realized that I'd been a cinephile and, and this is the power of cinema. The, this is, it's, it's a mass story and empathy delivering um, form, art form. Mm -hmm. And, and I'd always been, I'd, it had always been part of my life. Yeah. So, I mean, like, you know, with Tarantino, of course, you know, his, his, his heroes are from Hong Kong cinema and then you, right? your family, your family from Hong Kong, were you, what, were you, were you guys watching, TBB dramas? Were you were you yes. uh, circulating, uh, you know, like Hong Kong movies on VHS or all the yeah. your rental stores? What did you like? What did you like growing up? Um, I mean, yeah, we wa we watched. I mean, like when you're in Hong Kong, you watch just whatever whatever you know dramas are playing on TVB or Pearl, whatever. Um, mm -hmm. That those well, those were less interesting to me. I think what was most interesting to me was I think Jackie Chan was the you know you can't you can't get past Jackie Chan, and mm -hmm. we had these really really bad VHS. That it's not even his best movies, but I remember them really well. Do you remember one called City Hunter? Yeah, of course. Yeah. Right. City the Hunter. Video game? The, yeah. The video game and yeah, the yeah, yeah. and he's and he's so hungry and he's got yeah. and and he he looks at this woman in a bikini and all he sees are hamburgers where her breasts are. Yes. And yes. It's, yes. Just, it's just yes. the fruitiest movie. Mm -hmm. I I watched that movie until the VHS kind of you know got right. got marks right. on it. Right. Um, and uh, Rumble in the Bronx and. Bronx. Um, and then I discovered Bruce Lee a little bit later and um, we had Return of the Dragon, I think, on VHS and okay. I wore that out. And yeah, uh, yeah so that those, those were the, thing, the things that I was watching at home. Right, right. So, I mean, so now you're in university, you, 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 you go to the, you know, the dark side when you're taking that, that film class or something like that. Yeah. And then <laughs> yeah. you, you, you produce, uh, you, you, pr you, you make a, a documentary, Banana in a Nutshell. You know, so right. it's really inspired by your life. And in which, you know, uh, won awards, got you recognition and you decided to, and maybe because of that, you're, because of your father's kind of like penchant for chronicling stuff or archiving stuff, you know, you wanted to 
make this documentary? And then how did it turn into adapting that into a feature film? So, I mean, I'd made the documentary. I, I still maintain this. I made the documentary because I guess um, um, by that time I'd, I'd done an undergraduate degree and I'd done a master's degree in filmmaking and practical filmmaking. And I'd learned, I'd, you know, I was learning about screenwriting and directing at, at university. Um, and at the same time, there was something happening in my life. It's, it's, it's a very age old story. My parents didn't approve of my choice yeah. of a life partner. He, um, they didn't trust him. And, and I, and I think I was going through an identity crisis, but also a generational crisis where I couldn't decipher my parents' love language. Um, I, I think I, at the beginning of this process, when I started making that documentary, I thought that my parents didn't love me the way that I saw Western parents loving their children, because when, when Western parents love their children, they say, I love you. And I'm proud of you. My parents had never said this to me. Uh, instead, they'd say, have you eaten? Or exactly. yeah, yeah, yeah. don't eat too much <laughs> in, the, in the same yeah. mealtime. Right. Um, so, and then I realized that is their love language. Their love, yeah. I think exactly. through the process of making this documentary, I was like, oh, my God, I'm, I'm the asshole, not them. Mm. Uh, it's me. And um, and so um, we yeah we I, I submitted it to the um, New Zealand International Film Festival, mm -hmm. and um, I think that's where um, there, there's a there's a um, a studio here called uh, South Pacific Pictures, and they made they made Whale Rider and Sioni's mm -hmm. Wedding and and a, and a couple of other successful New Zealand movies, and they right. the, the the then. Um, I guess uh, CEO of that company came to a screening and then right at the end of the screening, he comes up to me and says, do you want to direct the dramatic version of this doc of this documentary? Oh, wow. Yeah. Wow. And that, yeah. and that never happened that, I mean, like I wasn't expecting that to happen. So certainly I thought I, it was going to be for me years of slog mm -hmm. um, of pitching my project to the likes of him. But he came to me mm -hmm. after watching this movie, and he's um, again. I, I owe I owe him as as much as I owe the the director of the film festival for um, believing in New Zealand film, for believing in new voices, new, right. new New Zealand voices. Yeah, right. And I mean, uh, how long was the process of like you know when when he said let's let's you know you should adapt your document into a feature film? Well, how how long was the process from from that moment to actually starting production, like you know, uh, yeah. it was five years. It okay. was five years. Um, yeah. It was it was it was a bunch of things. I wasn't writing full time in those five years, so I, in the meantime, I was making a living as an editor or, or an assistant editor. Yeah. So I um, back in when I was doing my masters, I, I I managed to get a job as a night assistant editor, mm -hmm. and then was learning the ropes in editorial, which I maintain is one of the best places for directors to learn their craft because the film is made the last time in the edit and, yeah. and the, and the, and the storytelling process in the edit is one of the most magical, but also um, important parts. It's the last time mm -hmm. um, you get to rewrite the movie. Um, so, so uh, um, I was working in editorial and writing and in, in development and um, it also the, 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 the story was autobiographical. So I, I had a really great co-writer. Um, we went through university together. Her name is Angeline Liu. And um, she was helping me write it because just to have an outside eye, because I don't know if I would have been able to write um, construct constructively uh, just from myself. And we yeah. also had a great uh, story consultant from South Pacific Pictures called Rachel Lang, who was helping us through that process. Got it. And you know, it was uh, you know, it it was the uh, little film that could, and it was a big success. Uh, it was released in twenty eleven or twenty ten or twenty eleven or twenty eleven. Yeah, we shot in twenty ten. Um, yeah. I was so excited to to be able to cast Hong Kong legends, Chen yeah. Pei Pei and Kenneth Jung, and yeah, um, and yeah, and and in fact, they were instrumental in bringing my parents around because they were really mad that I'd made this documentary. Right. And I guess Ed dirty laundry exposing exposing family secrets in a way that's the whole point right like it's like uh not really i mean like Aaron dirty is like you know it's like you know in the sense of, like why you're exposing our family to the world in a way right so yeah yeah, yeah. and I'm, I'm sure your parents were very uh 
they're like, oh, Cheng Pei Pei, you know, she's the famous Cheng Pei Pei or Kenneth Chang. He's like, you know, like it's like that kind of turned them around. Like, cause they, they're, to them, they're, they're probably superstars, right? Um, they yeah. are. They yeah. are. And then you yeah. have Kenneth, you have, uh, you know, Zhang Gong um, at, at a dinner table mm-hmm. saying to my parents, hey, I don't need to do another movie. Like, I chose to do this movie. Right. Um, and, and my dad going, wow, I thought this was a frivolous thing that, you know, my youngest daughter is embarking on. In, yeah. in a way, saying to your parents, I want to be a film director is yeah. a little bit, sounds a little bit like I want to be a rock star. Like, sure. not, that they're, not that they're the same. But, oh, no, 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 yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but it, but it feels frivolous. Like, it feels like, yeah, right, you know, right. Um, you're not going to do that. It was interesting uh, uh, that you cast, uh, you know, like Cheng Pei Pei and Kenneth Chang. Like, it's like, you know, why not cast like, um, you know, Asian Kiwi actors, older Kiwi, you know, who live in New Zealand? Was that a conscious choice uh, to choose those actors? Those aside from them being superstars to your parents, at least? Yeah, I mean, they're, they're, I mean the fact is, is that they're brilliant actors. Yeah. You know, yeah. they're, they're just, they, I didn't, need to audition them because I'd seen their right. work, you know, right. you, uh, Zhang Gong was in um, a Bond, Bond movie, <laughs> you know, right. with Pierce Brosnan and, sure. and Ching Pei Pei is Ching Pei Pei. Like, you, know, you can't yeah. get past, yeah. come drink with me. you know, yeah. Yeah. Come, come drink with me to Crouching Tiger, you know, oh, or yeah. to like, you, you just can't get past how great she is. So I was amazed actually. I, I, didn't, I never thought I'd be able to get them, but then, I don't know the sequence of events that happened. I think my cousin knew someone in New York who represented them. And then they, yeah, they, they were like, well, just ask the question that all they can say is no. And we asked, and then they asked her to see the script and then they were interested. And it's like, Oh my God. Mm -hmm. Um, It wasn't, it wasn't necessarily a conscious choice not to um, cast a New Zealand. Um, It just, it was just that, Oh, in a perfect world, imagine if we could get Ching Pei Pei to play the, you know, the mother character. And then, then, you know, you just never know who's going to say yes when if you ask. Yeah, I mean, for for this film, it definitely is autobiographical, and then you, you, you and then you kind of like, uh, in a way, you bootstrap your next productions like these web series, like um, oh, you did Flat Three, and then you did uh, you know like uh, you know on on the web series, uh, you know that um, oh, it will take three, and then also Flat Three, right? I believe, and then uh, yes. So so I mean, there are in a way are. I'm not maybe perhaps inspired also by, uh, you know, a lot of like experiences from Asian Kiwis, personal experiences, either from the industry or, or, or what have you. Can you just talk about kind of the development of those, of those two, particularly those two projects, Take Three and Flat Three? Um, yeah, so Take Three happened um, while, it, the, Take Three came out before My Wedding and Other Secrets. Mm-hmm. Um, I was, um, as you, as I said, I, I, I did speech and drama. I love performance right. and I had enjoyed oh, acting. Really quick. What can you just like in a nutshell, just, uh, explain what take three's plot is about. Uh, take three is three, uh, Kiwi Asian actors across three different auditions, okay. um, and their experiences in those auditions. So it's kind of like, yeah, it's a, tri- it's a, it's a film. It's a triptych inside a film, if you know what I mean, of right. the varying, experiences of three Kiwi Asian actors in the casting yeah. room. Yeah. Um, and, um, and so I'd, I, um, I was, I guess I'd be, I was dabbling in acting, not just for the joy of acting, but also to learn how to be a director's actor, because I want, I, that was a, um, that was something that I wanted to be. I wanted to be a, a, a director who loved the, who loved directing actors. And so I took an acting course again. It's this thing that if you, I would recommend every, director to take acting lessons because mm-hmm. then you realize how difficult the craft is mm-hmm. um and also you learn to you learn what language to use and and how to get the best performance that you need um so i was doing auditions as well and i i just i, I love comedy I, I like quite i have quite a weird sense of humor i think quite um it's a it's a bit odd um and I just, when I was, um, I think I was in an audition and I was asked to seductively put on some lipstick, but what they'd given me was a pen. They did, they're like, okay, here, take this pen and just seductively put on lipstick with the pen. And I'm, I'm like, in, this is fertile ground for comedy. This is just fertile ground for, and not just comedy, like for some kind of interrogation. 
sure. of of what it is. And and yeah, we yeah. the roles that I would get through my agent were you you know mm-hmm. the classic tropes of the sure. the dragon woman, the prostitute, right. okay. the the servant, you know, yeah. and yeah. 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 Uh, and then what about uh, your web series? Because uh, that was, uh, you know, also, uh, it was, it's hilarious. It's it's like, <laughs> it's like, um, you know, like Three's Company meets girls in a way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, Thank you. Can you talk about, can you talk about that? Um, yeah. So we were watching girls and, and, and um, Awkward Black Girl, actually, on, mm-hmm. on uh, and. Um, it's a raise uh, web series right yeah yeah that's right she was she was coming to the fore with her really cool web series and broad city as well broad city was a web series then right um high maintenance that was around that sort of i guess the uh, yeah the golden age of web series just starting to be golden um and we were inspired by that and um the these uh these three kiwi asian actors came and and they were like hey we're not writers but we'd really like to work together and it was exa- it was so weird it was like we're so sick of not being able to control our careers mm-hmm. we we as actors you you that's this you could be the best actor in the world and still not book anything it's mm-hmm. about the market and the and the and the roles that Right. productions deign deign to offer you right. so they were like we kind of want to it's control also, our narrative it's also the gatekeepers too right yeah to be right. honest yeah exactly decision makers but go ahead yeah so they felt powerless as actors and they felt well web series is a way where we can at least have fun and control not control but just uh, speak in our speak with our voices and uh, but we don't write so would you write something and I said oh this sounds interesting what do you want to do and we watched a bit of girls and and awkward black girl and then we were like okay we want to do that but lo-fi <laughs> and mm-hmm. um and I wrote it and then I was like hey can I direct it and they were like sure and then I was directing and I said hey can I edit this and so I edited the first season and um it was just this beautiful and and then we were like yeah if it's good then we'll put it online. If it's not good, then no harm, no foul, right? Yeah. Um, but surprisingly, yeah, um, Asian Americans. Uh, in fact, again, I have to, I have to credit Phil Yu, angry Asian guy, yeah. for writing a blog about it. He was like, yeah. "My new favorite web series. Have you heard of these girls from New Zealand?" We got a great Asian American um, community who were who watched our series on YouTube. It's that's how I found a, out about it. Right. What a wonderful yeah. world. Yeah. 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 So, and it also, like, I mean, did you just, like, I mean, and that's how it is, like, especially you put on YouTube, just, like, post it and see what happens, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah, and, he, and it, finds a, it finds an audience, and it did find an audience organically, uh, especially from the, you know, Asian, I mean, a lot of, especially in the Asian American um, uh, media landscape where, you know, especially this is, like, you know, uh, the early 2000, you know, 2011, 2012, 13 or something. That you know, I mean, there's you know, this is like this is pre, crazy rich Asians, pre you know, all that stuff. So um, to find an audience is, is is great, and then I think you can also kind of built that audience in New Zealand as well, because I think you did eventually do three seasons. Is that correct? Yes. Or, okay. Yes, we did and then, three seasons. And then yeah. and the third season was actually funded, right, by like a yes. terrestrial channel. Okay. Uh, by we were funded by um, uh, New Zealand on air. Um, so that's our local, our local broadcaster. Yeah. Got it. Got it. Yeah. And, and then, uh, yeah, that's great. So it's like, um, so it's, it's interesting cause you, you kind of delve into, uh, I mean, I, I would say kind of like your, the first part of your career, your version career is basically dealing with the, these Asian Kiwi issues, also, you know, awkward comedy and all that stuff. Uh, uh, but you are, and then kind of like, I would say in your next phase, uh, I would say like, um, but you are a fan of genre, you know, like, uh, you know, uh, martial arts or you name it. And, um, you know, with uh, Do No Harm, uh, can you talk about that? Which is uh, just an amazing film. And I mean, we, we'll, we'll, we'll devote a, a bunch of this talk to Do No Harm. I want to I really get into the nitty gritty of it. So oh, talk sure. about the, yeah. the inspiration behind Do No Harm. Um, the inspiration behind Do No Harm was motherhood and um, my my sister's medical background. So there's, I mean, there's two things that I always bring up with Do No Harm. The first is that um, I became a mother um, mm-hmm. just, and uh, I think when I was shooting My Wedding and Other Secrets, I had, a new, I had my first baby when we were shooting, he was nine months old. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, when I had this baby, uh, you know, the, 
people talk about parenthood comes this great well of love and patience and you just didn't know that your body was capable of this and these amazing things mm -hmm. and you're like oh my god i i'm uh, i'm a superwoman um in a good and kind way yeah <laughs> but it, but there was this other thing which was like i knew that if any anyone tried to hurt my baby i was capable of murder and violence sure. that I, in a way that I, I didn't realize I had been before. And mm -hmm. this is something that uh, I think lots of parents really um, after talking, after watching Do No Harm and talking about the inspiration for where it came from, I found that this is a common thread through parents. It's almost like a violent fantasy. It's like you try and harm my baby. Mm -hmm. I, dare you. <laughs> I dare you because I've got a well of violent of potential violence inside of me so big that you don't want to, you know, this, this mama bear and it's not just mama bears, um, but this, this mama bear rage. Um, sure. And, and it, it wasn't, it wasn't that dignified. Like it, 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 it sounds badass, but it also sounds, it, it feels kind of yucky as well. It feels yeah. wrong. Right. And I, and I was, I guess I was interested in that, you know, I, I love, violence in films i love action movies mm -hmm. but it also comes with this um an uncomfortableness about yeah. we love revenge we love people visiting violence on on other human beings mm -hmm. but it's also wrong it, it, it it's it's bad it's wrong to feel this way even though we love revenge revenge yeah. is inherently wrong because it's never because if we keep on celebrating revenge then that then really we're who are you know what what is humanity, humanity yeah. Yeah, um, yeah so that so that was the first thing and then the second thing was my sister who is now a surgeon um was telling me about one night she was working at the er and um this man comes in and he's half dead because he's been attacked by a mob um but the reason he's been attacked by a mob is because he took a child and threw the child off a bridge, killing the child. Oh my God. And she's a mother herself. And she was the lead surgeon that, in, you know, in the ER yeah. that night. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And she, she said to me, she was looking at him. She had that if morality. She did nothing, right? Yeah. If she did nothing, he would die. Right. And she could be his judge and executioner. Mm. but that's not her job her job is to be his physician is to right. be and that's where do no harm comes from right the hippocratic you know, oath. your hippocratic oath that's yeah. what her job was and she put aside you know she, it was hard but she mm. put it this this ethical conundrum that she that she had to deal with in that in that case mm -hmm. was incredibly fascinating to me and still is actually um Wow. So, so yeah, so that's, that's where Do No Harm came from. And, and it also was a proof of concept for, for a, another action movie that I'd been working on, but that's, sure. that's in the works. In the works. Okay. Got it. Uh, but like, I mean, like, no, I mean, just, just the, oh, I, I like the, you know, the, the, I guess the Cheng Pei Pei connection from your other form of because you, that starts her daughter, Marsha. Yes, right? that's right. Marcia yeah, Marsha. Yeah. 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 Who has been at HIF uh, uh, a couple years ago? She's she's yes. lovely. Um, yes. But but uh, but you know, just talk about. Um, I mean, I mean, again, you know, like I, I know you you were a fan. You talked about earlier. You love Jack Chan movies. You you, you know Bruce Lee. You love genre. Pulp Fiction was a, another turning point for you. You snuck into the theater underage to watch Pulp Fiction. <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> but, but I mean, but in your work prior to Do No Harm was like kind of very much. You know, like, you know, just just awkward comedies, and like, you know, like it's like. So why did I mean? I mean, like, this must have been like for people who are following your career, like, you know, they were like, well, where did this come from? You know, like it's like, yeah, it's completely it's bloody. There's lots of martial arts. It's like it's in a confined <laughs> space. Uh, like, what? How did you kind of like prepare yourself as a director? Did you uh to kind of like do the choreography, for example, or like you know, like all, all that stuff? Do you know, kind of like set pieces and all that stuff? Just talk about that versus just pointing a camera, just putting a camera there and having two people talk. 
Yeah, I mean, I think before then, um, because I, you know, I've always been a, an action genre person, like right from when I was studying, you can, you know, when, when I had to write my thesis screenplay, it was a vampire movie. And mm. so I, I'd, I'd always, you know, I, I, I in, in a way you could say that my identity movie or my awkward comedy was, it was the diversion, not, right. not the, not the action. So I was coming right. back home, maybe after having dealt with some personal issues, right? Like um, I'd worked out, certain things about my identity and I'd come to peak to a certain piece. Um, mm. And then, and then I was able to set on that path um, down the genre path, which I always was on or always had meant to come back to. Mm. Um, I prepared myself by interning. Um, I interned on um, a number of films and TV shows that were shooting in New Zealand. Um, I, I, and with, with the help of the New Zealand film commission and um, they have really great talent development um, um, and they would fund me to go on an internship with the stunt team of Ash vs. Evil Dead, which was shooting here. Yeah, um, or um, Lee Tamahori, which is, you yeah. know, one of our most yep. amazing directors in New yeah, Zealand, once, was shooting. Once we're warriors. Yeah. Right, Once We're Warriors, and, and, um, and he did a Bond movie. Yep. And in fact, yeah, I, I'm, I'm thinking it might be the one with Kenneth Jung in it. But um, yeah. so. Tomorrow Never Dies. Yeah, t- Tomorrow Never Dies with Pierce Brosnan, right? Um, and Michelle Yeoh. Right. Uh, oh, my gosh, I hadn't made that connection. But, um, yeah, so Lee Tamahori was just is, – is so approachable and was and said, well, come on to this movie where I'm shooting this car sequence and you can you can have a look at how we do it. And so I I, I watched Masters and Experience oh, sorry, people. Wrong, wrong, sorry, wrong Bond movies. Uh, he did he – did, uh, uh, the world is not enough. Sorry, excuse me. Oh, he did. The world is not enough. Yeah, I'm yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, 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 I got that mixed up. But, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but uh, yeah. Anyway, like uh, Lee Tamahori, um, uh, master of action. That that the end scene of uh, Once Warriors is, is such a gut punch, right? Oh my god! Yeah, yeah. Um. So so I wanted to hear about his process, and he was very very open to talk to me about his process. So, um. When I, by the time I got onto um, the set of Do No Harm, I already knew what I wanted to do. And I'd been working with a really amazing stunt choreographer, um, stunt coordinator called Tim Wong, mm. who's a Kiwi Chinese guy as well, who mm. is now, you know, working on internet. He, uh, he was on Mad Max Fury Road. He was on, he, he, um, he was most recently, I think I'm allowed to say this, on Suicide Squad 2 with James Gunn and, and, yeah he's he's the real deal you know yeah. like I, I i love working with him and i and i met him on i mean i, I knew him before but he uh, was also working on the shows that i was interning on yeah right 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 so i mean like uh in a way uh do no harm is a a great calling card to shadow in the cloud because of uh the fact that it's in a confined space essentially one location, you know, I don't want to give away too much, uh, with John McLeod, but, you know, I see a lot of similarities, uh, you know, uh, with, um, um, the char- main character, for example, you know, so, um, and then, so like, uh, for Shadow McLeod, which is, you know, kind of inspired by, I mean, for me, I actually love the film. I, when I saw it at the Toronto film festival and, uh, you know, it was, it was really, you know, just, um, kind of very much uh, in that real house of like, you know, it reminded me of like uh, Twilight Zone, Amazing Stories, you know, like these kind of like genre set pieces, like, and it's a period piece. Um, um, can you talk about kind of like your, uh, I mean, um, I guess, what was your take on crafting the story, especially with, um, with you know, with Chloe Grace Moretz as the lead character and what, what, what was kind of, in a way, you know, you're trying to make an impact with in in, in this with the genre of film. What was your take on making it rise above the rest of you know of other type of genre films of, of that nature? Um, I I love genre meshes. Uh, I I love movies that I can't predict. You know right. what what's going to happen, but I also have a deep love of genre. So I would like to think that. This is, this is an homage or this is a love letter to all mm-hmm. those things that you've talked about as well as Indiana Jones, as well as Alien and Aliens, right. as well as, you know, the, it's um, 
everything I love about action was um, in this movie because it's character driven, it's theme driven. Um, everything that happens in that movie has been thought about. Um, uh, Chloe and I, Chloe came into the project while I was still working on the script. And I will also acknowledge that the script came to me from another script writer who has since been disgraced. Sure. Um, and he was not involved um, in the writing when, when I, he, he was, I, I didn't have any dealings with him. So I took the project mm -hmm. and I thankfully for the thank, thanks to the studio and the producers was allowed to make it, um, in the way that I that I wanted to make it in partnership with Chloe and all the HODs and all the producers yeah. that that worked on the movie. Right. So what you're seeing on screen is uh, my jam. I I love how it's and um, it's a kind of uncategorized. It's 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 difficult to categorize the movie. Mm -hmm. It's um it's uh it's not exactly a war movie. No. Because it's it's not a lest we forget movie, and anyone who's looking for right, right. any kind of historical um, yeah. uh, lest we forgetness, please don't watch the movie because you won't like it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's not. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it is an action movie, but it's not. It doesn't have that much action in it. It's not exactly a horror movie because because it's it's about um, yeah, it's about it's about something that's very about our society i guess and in, in some ways maybe that is horror that horror yeah. That's the, be the best the best horror always make, puts a mirror to the audience right, like right, right. the best horror is yeah, yeah. humans humans are the monster yeah exactly. that, that's <laughs> that, that's that's the best horror um right right yeah yeah um yeah it, it is so um anyway um so, I, so, yeah yeah so let me, I mean, I, there's two things I want to talk about for the film, right? Because I don't want to give away anything because, you know, we have, uh, we have a you know, screening this weekend, but we're also doing a drive-in screening next weekend, which is going to be really awesome. exciting. Uh, yep. but, um, but, like, I want to talk about two things about Shadow McLeod. First of all, Chloe Grace Moret's face. I mean, you know, I, I mean, her face. I mean, there's a lot of shots when it's just her face, you know? Yeah. Just talk about Chloe Grace, <laughs> Grace Moret's face. How I mean, she's like, I mean, I mean, I mean, you know, she's she's very, she's you know, a very beautiful actress, and very unique looking. I never, never, ne never noticed how almost like ethereal, almost like anime as she is her face. You know, can you just talk about uh, just her face? You know, and especially how it's so <laughs> instrumental in the film. And again, yeah, I'm not, I'm not being a creep. I'm just like, it's, really, <laughs> it's very crucial to the film. I think you know. So, so first of all, let's talk about her face. And then you're you're, um, you're you're composing those shots because there's a lot of um them. yeah there's a lot of her yeah. I mean as yeah. you say as you uh, I mean uh, I don't think she would take offense if we said yeah. that yeah. she's easy on the eyes she just is um, but she's more than that you know yeah. she uh, you can have someone easy on the eyes and be bored with them um, mm -hmm. Chloe I don't know it's some kind of cinematic magic I don't know what it is when you put her uh, through a lens some kind of alchemy happens in that you can't, you can't stop watching her. Mm -hmm. And, and maybe this is her kind of her craft that, that she will never give away. But I, I mean, like uh, her process is very hers. She was the most, I would say she was the most, if not one of the most experienced people on set. She's mm -hmm. been doing this since she was five years old. This yeah. is film, yeah. film number 60 something. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> this, this is my second movie. My first movie <laughs> yeah, yeah, with, yeah. A, with an, an, with an American system. Sure. And, um, and she just knows, she just knows what works. She knows what works yeah. for her. Yeah. And um, I, I don't know what happened there. Anderson. like I, I, when I, when we were getting the rushes, I was like, wow, this, this is great. Um, yeah. uh, Kit, our DOP, did an incredible job of lighting everything and making it look, have that sort of, um, I think I wanted to kind of make, have it sentiment, you know, a sentimental, you know, again, I wanted to make it a love movie, uh, sorry, a love movie, a love letter to pulp, pulpy movies, right? That's it's right. just, it's just a fun yeah. pulpy movie. Yep. Um, but uh, I, and in the edit, I, wa I would watch her, you know, it's, it's a lot of the movies just, as you say, just her face like this. Yep. 
And yep. and you then you get tired of it. And this was a producerial note. It's like, how are we going to keep the audience interested? I watched her thousands upon thousands of times across. I think our edit period was a seven to nine month edit period. Mm -hmm. I never got sick of her. Yeah. No. There was always something new to look at. There was, like, oh my god, she did this micro expression at this moment. Mm -hmm. well, there's this, the, you know, and and all credit to our editor Tom Eagles for finding those, you know, for also putting it together in such a way where she's endlessly um, interesting to look at, Absolutely. and you could just kind of you could just watch her for hours. And I did. I watched her ten hours a day for seven to nine months. And I never got sick of her. Right. So I, that's some kind of magic. I, I, don't, I, I don't know how that happens. but yeah. yeah, I mean, kudos to Claire Grace Moretz's face, but also her acting and yeah, her, craft. her craft. But also my second thing I want to talk about is also the sound design. It's incredible. And Thank you. And we talk about kind of the, because again, you know, again, it's, it's, it's uh, I don't want to, you know, like it's, it is a very unique film. You, don't, you can't pinpoint what type of genre it is. It's, it could be almost like a, you know, but in a way, it's, it's again, like do no harm. It's in a kind of confined space, you know, and, uh, and you know, like, um, and I think with the sense of like, and it's by design that it is in a confined space and very, you know, um, claustrophobic, but, you know, just having the, you know, kind of, for me, it's always, I, I find like sound is more important than picture. And so you can talk about kind of the, the process of the, the sound design and, you know, you know, uh, sound effects and also the sound design, you know, uh, uh, of designing the whole kind of soundtrack and uh, background um, uh, noise and all the, all the sound effects. Um, I agree with you. You know, this is one of those classic things that directors always say to each other, which is sound is half the movie. And sometimes it's said in a slightly facetious way, but sure. for this movie in particular, when mm -hmm. you have just one person for, you know, 60% of the movie, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's so it's it's even more important, and especially one that's you know psychological like this. I mm. mean, there was there was only really one point of view for this movie to be in, and it was for the lead character. Mm -hmm. So everything you hear is what she's hearing. Your experience as the audience is her experience, and it's not it's unreliable as well. Mm -hmm. um, you just don't know. You know, at some point, you don't know whether she's telling the truth. You don't know has she been lying to me this whole time? Why is she acting like this? Is she yep. the villain in this piece? And, and that was very deliberate. And, um, and so um, we have a real, again, a very dedicated um, uh, sound team um, who almost killed themselves, <laughs> um, stay up, like staying up till 3 a.m. at night, just like trying out Foley sounds. And yeah. you know, I think the, there's a, I, I feel like I'm giving it away, but there was one particular no voice of one of the characters that we, 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 we took from um, biology, you know, mm. there were 20, 30 different animal noises right. that we smushed together, tried out, you know, no, I don't like that. Yes. I like that. What's that? There was even, there was even, a bowed cactus in there. I don't um, know how the sound designer found found this yeah. piece of like this, but there, someone had had drawn a a bowed, bowed cactus. Is, it, is that what you said? So yeah, like a, a cactus oh. spine, and someone had taken like a violin bow and played the ah, spine. Wow. Yeah, that noise is in there, and it sounds. Oh. Like a, it sounds like a organic sound. It sounds like the voice of an animal. Wow. Um, so there are frogs, seals, uh, uh, bats, um, uh, birds, bowed cactuses. There's, um, they, they, the, the sound team went to a container ship and, and, and one sound guy would be inside and the other guy would be running across the roof of the container to get the mm. sounds. And then they'd actually, you know, because it takes place in a B-17 bomber, they'd, um, they'd contacted an air base in America to see if they could get some, you know, sound libraries. And they, they really went over and above and, um, you know, in baking, they say you can taste the love. Right. Maybe, maybe what you're hearing in the sound is the love that the sound. Team <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, and also, I mean, I just, again, are you a Kate Bush fan? Yes, I always was. Yeah. And um, that, that was actually something that our editor, I mean, Tom Eagles is really a two for one in that he, his music taste is exquisite. Yeah. yeah. 
and and very broad, very eclectic. Yeah. And um, you know, yes, I'm I was already a Kate Bush fan, but I, you know, he he tried he played this. He was the one who put that end track on. Right. That's um, right. Yeah. And he was like, "You have to fight for this track." And I was like, Absolutely. "Well, it's quite expensive." And he goes, "No, you have to fight for that track." So, yeah. Perfect. Yeah. Perfect in the film. Yeah. So like it's like uh, uh, so I mean like um. That's great. And like, you know, I think, uh, you know, world premiered at the Toronto International Film Festival in the Midnight Madness section. Peter Kaplowski, who is the Midnight Programmer, Midnight Madness Programmer there. Um, you know, he was uh, very, uh, he helped me, he was very instrumental in getting me um, uh, in contact with, the, you know, the, the producers and also the distributors and stuff like that. And, you know, the film won the audience award, uh, the Midnight Madness audience award in Toronto. That's, that's a huge, huge deal. And, you know, and then it was sold to the U.S., you know? Yeah. So yep. yeah, so I mean, I think the uh, the the I think the the current plan is to release it next summer. Is that yep. the idea? Yeah. Okay. So yeah, I mean, coming coming soon. We don't know exactly when. Yeah. Sure, 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 sure. So um, I mean, like it's like uh, um, and then so what are you working on next? I mean, like I know you you know you you I know you're working on a TV series now, but also I read about Do No Harm, you know, and you know and where, where that that's coming from. So where that's going next? So can you just maybe kind of let us uh, just give us some 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 hints of what you're working on right now. Well, I, yeah, I, I want to talk about this TV show, which is okay. Great. Like, okay. Yeah. Well, I mean, I'm I'm in post on it now. Um, okay. We shot it across two separate breakdowns, uh, not breakdowns, two separate lockdowns in in New Zealand. Yeah. Um, and we are hoping to for it to reach an international audience. Um, it's a post apocalyptic comedy. Um, it's about a world eight years after a virus has wiped out all the world's men. Um, mm -hmm. We started the we started <laughs> we started this project in 2018, so it's it's not pandemic yeah. triggered right. like it right. it just the pandemic just sort of happens anyway. So it's a, it's a set in the world eight years after a virus has wiped out all the world's men. Um, everything's going swimmingly. Women are ruling the world. It's going well. Um, there is. Sperm banks and fertility is normal, but unfortunately, boy embryos are dying in, in, um, in utero before they can be born. So the human race is kind of in a dire straits. Um, in this big world, we go to a small rural town in New Zealand where these women, um, these three Kiwi Asian farmers um, who look suspiciously like the three women from Flat 3, Okay. <laughs> um, and are, are in fact one and the same. Um, <laughs> not their characters; they're they're different characters. Oh, okay, um, but the same the same actors um, uh, accidentally run someone over one night in in a small rural New Zealand town, and uh, on inspecting the body, realise that it is a man hmm. who has somehow survived um, and uh, is uh, has remained undetected for the last eight years. So oh, wow. um, instead of handing him over to the authorities, they decide to keep him in their shed for themselves. <laughs> and the show is called Creamery. Oh, my God. Okay. Yeah. 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 Got it. Got it. Got it. Yeah. Got it. Yeah. Uh, hilarious. Um, yeah. In so many ways. <laughs> <laughs> um, but like, so like, it's great. So can talk about, um, that's wonderful that you're working with the, um, the flat three you know, the actors that you're collaborating with them again. And, and then, you know, I mean, can you talk about as an Asian Kiwi, how is the kind of community there when it comes to Asian Kiwis working in the film and TV industry there as well? I mean, when you think of New Zealand, you think of, of course, like the New Zealand Film Commission is very supportive of, and you, know, you think of, 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 you know, TV and film there. And, but you're also thinking of like, you know, Taika Waititi, you're thinking of Maori, you know, the, the renaissance of Maori, you think of Whale Rider, you're thinking of, you know, uh, Lee Tamahori, you know, you're thinking of um, yeah. Nikki, Ka Nikki Taro or something like that. Uh, but um, how, I mean, you know, are you seeing more and more, uh, I guess, like, I guess the stuff being greenlit by other, like, for example, Asian Kiwis, uh, you know, like a work uh, in TV and film as well? Um, um, we could do with more. Mm -hmm. uh, I always um, we I think what uh, what is interesting is um, I've been part of um, a new guild in New Zealand called the Pan Asian Screen Collective, um, mm -hmm. and we because statistically in New Zealand there is a dearth of um, Asian 
Kiwis in uh, creative positions. Mm -hmm. um, so producers, writers, directors, there's a real dearth of them, especially producers. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I, I think what's really important is that it's not like, I certainly haven't felt that being an, a Kiwi Asian has um, hobbled me in any way. If, if anything, I feel that, um, especially with my wedding and other secrets and banana in a nutshell, my ethnicity and who I am has been a, bo a boon for my career. Um, but what is kind of unfortunate is that I made that film in 20, we shot in 2010, it came out in 2011. There hasn't been... A, another Kiwi Asian movie since then. There is one in actually in post production now. Mm -hmm. So I'm very happy there's one, but mm -hmm. one That's isn't one. enough. Yeah, of course not. One, yeah. one more in 10 years is not good enough. And, right. and, I ju and it's, I'm, not, I'm not casting aspersions on anyone sure. because the onus lies on our community as much as the funders. Mm -hmm. But um, some, something's not right. The, the status quo is not right mm -hmm. and I think look, many people are trying to figure out where the issue is and it could be many things it could be opportunities it could be funding it could be this idea that New Zealanders don't when they think of New Zealanders they don't imagine Asian New Zealanders yeah. um, or and it could be you know from our communities is that when uh, like I said when you say you want to be a filmmaker Asian parents or, you know, new immigrants or first gen generation immigrants usually will be like, that's too risky. You know, it comes from a place of love and concern. It's like, but it's not a known path to financial comfort, this industry. So I can understand when parents wouldn't encourage their children to pursue, to take a similar path as mine because it's a hard road and it's not a financially sustainable one for the most part, even whether you're Asian or not. Mm -hmm. So if we can somehow um, break those stigmas or um, educate people on how to have a career, um, for instance, editorial, you know, there's lots of jobs in editorial in New Zealand. We're having a boon here in the industry with lots right. of international jobs coming our way. There right. is actually a shortage of editorial people. There's a shortage of crew people in New Zealand mm -hmm. and agents could be filling those roles. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's work in progress. Let's put it that way. We're not there yet. I'm not, I don't think anyone would say that we're happy with yeah. the way things are now. Right. So, I mean, you, you, so, you know, I think uh, when I, when I sum up like Roseanne Liang's like body of work, you know, like it's like, you know, like, you, I mean, a lot of it was informed by your personal experience, autobiographical, and it has that kind of like, you know, for, for me as a, you know, uh, as an American, like uh, that, that kind of off kilter Kiwi uh, awkward comedy, you know, that's really very, <laughs> yeah. you know, uh, and then, and then, then you're all, and then now you're deep into the genre space, you know, you're, blood, guts, violence, you know, like it's not <laughs> part of it. I love it. You know, like it's like, but is there any, is there a genre or like, you know, maybe uh, that you haven't tackled that you want to, uh, you know, take on? I mean, do we see, you know, uh, you know, the next stage of like, you know, do we see Roseanne Liang, uh, you know, um, overtaking like, you know, Jane Campion or something like that? You know, like, it's like, <laughs> like, or like, you know, like our Merchant Ivory period, Jane Austen or something like that, you know, like what, where do you where do you see uh, are, are there any other kind of like what other tricks are in, up your sleeve when it comes to that? <laughs> what genres do you want to do? Yeah, I mean, I, I um, in this journey through the American um, ecosystem, which mm -hmm. has been so positive. Like, I had such a positive. It was intense, but a really mm -hmm. positive experience with Shadow in the Cloud and working with yeah. studios and American producers, in you know, in, in tandem with New Zealand producers, yeah. was that um, I I want to be a Hollywood action director, and mm -hmm. and 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 it, it sounds so like I'm embarrassed when it comes out my mouth <laughs> because, because I, because, you know, the worst thing in New Zealand is to be up yourself is to think too much of yourself. Right. Oh, yeah, yeah, and yeah. so, 
when I say I want to be a Hollywood action director, there's instantly a, a cultural cringe that kind of takes over myself. I was like, "Ugh, you think you're all that? You're nothing. Like you're no one." Um, which which is actually common, you know, this whole imposter syndrome thing. But sure. um, yeah, I'm I'm just gonna say it. I want to be a Hollywood action director. The kinds of films that I want to, that I'm climbing up the mountain to are Terminator Two, Aliens. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, Mad Max Fury Road, The Matrix. These are these are perennial action movies. Die Hard. These are the movies that we watch over and over again. They're not just a genre movies. Mm-hmm. They're not just great spectacle, and they are. You know, they're incredible uh, action design. Um, you know, I, I'm thinking of Mission Impossible um, uh, Fallout. That the bathroom scene. These these are these are the these are the movies. These are the sequences that stick in our minds and become part of who we are about why we why movie magic is so magical mm-hmm. um they 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 work on they work on so many levels they work on an intellectual level it, you know the the message of terminator 2 is that humans are shit but mm-hmm. if robots can learn to value human life then maybe there's hope for us that's mm-hmm. still that's still so urgent and dangerous and sad for the now right oh, um yeah. the they work on an intellectual level, they work on an emotional level. What would a mother do for her son? You know, Sarah Connor's a terrible mother, but she's she's fierce. It's again that mama bear energy sure. is endlessly interesting. Um yeah. and you know, they 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 work and they and then they work on a social like the the new thing, and not the new thing. The thing is the social message, you know, why why is get out? Why is Invisible Man? Why are these um why is uh what's another great movie? Um it follows. I'm, I'm talking about genre movies, great genre movies. Yep. Why do they stick in our minds? Why do they feel perennial and urgent and dangerous? Because mm-hmm. they're talking about something that is, that is new and relevant and urgent to the now. Um, mm-hmm. the, that, that's what I'm, that, that's where, that's the mountain I'm climbing, hopefully. Mm-hmm. I, and I think to close, uh, you know, this, this session, we're running a little over time, but like you talk about, I mean, especially in the genre space, you know, like it's like you know, you're looking at like horror, sci-fi, fantasy, and stuff like that. It's very, it's very uh, male dominant, male culture, and there's there's also some, of course, there's toxicity in it in, in the sense like you know, I mean, and like you know, you, um, I mean, and then you know, like you as as working in this space as a you know, based a director, um, um, how do you? I mean, you know, this is like I, I just love that the genre space, especially in horror, like you know. There are like so many great, um, you know, women academics who are you know, talking to you about horror. There are like you know, like uh, uh, directors. You see like this like new age of like of uh, I guess elevated horror. You know, uh, elevated genre that is coming out. You know, like um, for example, like Raw or like Revenge and stuff like that. You know, these are these are great great films. And um, and you even pointed out like you know what these strong female characters, Sarah Connor. You think of you know, like Elizabeth. You know, uh, you know. Um, uh, you think uh, uh, you know the invisible you know the invisible man or something like that you know like it's like um you know and then shadow the clouds another, another great example and do no harm you know that the mom of their energy that you're like, uh, you know kind of like exploring um so i mean do you there definitely there's like a a sea change when it comes to more a sense of diversity in this space um so maybe any, any closing comments about what you're what you what you what you want to bring to this space uh, not only as a you know Asian Kiwi, but also as a you know a woman uh, who loves the genre. Um, I I just want to I I want to make great movies that stand the test of time. I want to make great action. I want to make interesting sci-fi with horror elements. You know, I, I I'm capable of doing this. If I if I get to be a serial filmmaker, then I'm happy, um, mm-hmm. and I get and I get the chance to be able to express my voice every time. Um, uh, whether or not I'm a woman, I'm hoping should be irrelevant. You know, mm-hmm. uh, you're right. It is male dominated, um, but those men, uh, a good number of them, are also the, the the makers of the movies that inspired me. That's true. Um, Tarantino, Fincher, James Cameron, yeah. um, yeah. Ridley Scott, the, the uh, Stanley Kubrick. These are all men who have you know you hear the stories about them. They're not the nicest men sometimes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. But they they made the movies that started the magic that 
that put me on this path. So ideally, um, one day, I hope that my ethnicity and my gender are not part of the conversation because I just want to be a great action director. Exactly. Um, and, uh, but you know, we, the, the, like, like I said, like, I think, I think we all agree the status quo is not right. The, mm -hmm. the, the, and, and as you say, there is a sea change happening. You know, I couldn't be happier for mm -hmm. Nia DaCosta who's, you know, now yeah. make, making one of the biggest movies that's going to be out in the future, making Candyman. Yeah. Candyman uh, and also Captain Marvel too, right? Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. So, I yeah. mean, that's, that's where she should be. Mm -hmm. um, that's where more of us should be. The fact that she's a black woman, the fact that she's young shouldn't be relevant, but at the same time should be celebrated because we need more of it. And sure. hopefully one day it will be irrelevant. Um, mm -hmm. but one day it will be irre irrelevant, but um, yeah. for now. I mean, yeah, I mean, absolutely. Absolutely. It's, it's very true. I mean, it should be irrelevant, but at the same time, the fact that you directed Shadow, wrote and directed Shadow in the Cloud, and then, you know, I think it definitely has a very, at least, you know, I'm not to say it's, uh, you know, it explores a lot of like, you know, um, contra you know, things that, you know, when it comes to gender disparity, it's not only because it's the, you know, of the, because it's a period piece or anything like that. These are challenges that are, you know, that women are, you know, face, you know, even today, you know? So I think it's like, in a way that's like, it only can come from your perspective. It makes it mm -hmm. more, I guess, authentic, I guess, in a way, you know? Um, so, and I think, it's, and, in, and it's still framed in the sense that pulpy kind of sci-fi, you know, like horror, you know, genre, which is really, really fun, which makes it, and that's always the best, that's, that's always the best kind of like um, genre anyway, you know, to have that familiar, yeah. familiarity, but also at the same time exploring kind of, and again, putting a mirror into, on, to the audience and saying, you know, like, you know, and just kind of a sense of self-reflection, so society yeah so, on yeah that i note, mean yeah yeah go ahead go ahead no i just i just wanted to say that you know i i no one will tell a story like i tell a story yeah um you know and and i i take the mental uh, you know i take the responsibility of storytelling incredibly seriously like all my favorite action directors mm -hmm. so you know uh, yes only i can tell the story that i can tell it but then um, in, in the same way that every that every film that I love comes through the voice or the lens of 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 a of a, of, a, of another great storyteller. So yeah, that's yeah, and no, no no different from you know um uh you know take three or you know like or your web series or you know this upcoming series you're working on Creamery. You know I think it's like yeah. you know I think it's a, a lot of it informed by your your your, your personal experiences as well. So. Uh, so yeah. So on that note, uh, I know we, we ran a little over time. Um, I want to thank you again, Roseanne, for joining us uh, in this conversation. As far as thank the, you, Anderson, um, and thank you also to the Vilcek Foundation yeah, and um, the Hawaii International Film Festival. Absolutely, and also you will be back tomorrow, I believe, right? For uh, yes, I will be another another panel discussion, which we are hosting uh, tomorrow, November fourteenth at one p.m. Hawaii Standard Time. Uh, uh, as you know, uh, it's, it's basically our kind of um, all the you know the participants in this NAP program. Most of them will be participating in this in this in this panel discussion as part of 2020's New American Perspectives program uh, in partnership with Vilcek Foundation. Uh, we're presenting this free panel discussion with filmmakers following this year's program, including you know not only um, uh, you know uh, the filmmakers Yi Chen, Valerie Castillo Martinez, Bassam Tariq, Ha Wu, and of course Roseanne will also be. Uh, joining us in this panel. Uh, they'll discuss their careers, their works, and their experiences as foreign-born artists working in, you know, kind of American mainstream pop cinema and TV. So, uh, sign up for that. And, you know, it's tomorrow at 1 p.m. Uh, Hawaii Standard Time. So, on that note, thank you again, Roseanne, and uh, thank you again for the audience for you know, listening to us, or me, me basically just ranting and raving, but... Uh, uh, but uh, we're, I'm very excited about your career, Roseanne, you know, like, and uh, look forward to seeing more, the more, you know, just you know, the crazier, zanier stuff that you come out. I just can't wait to check it out. So, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm a big fan. So thank you very much again. Thank and, you so uh, much, Anderson. And we'll talk, we'll talk very soon. Yeah. So take care, everyone. Cheers. Bye. Bye. -bye.